it's my nice uh, pleasure to meet uh, Mario Hills from uh, Technical University of Graz, from Automotive Institute of Engineering, or... Yeah, that, that's sure correct, yeah. That's correct, and uh, he will introduce us with the, with the technologies uh, which are developed, or mm, maybe... Uh, how to say interests in, in their department and uh, what he focuses on on this uh, branch of uh, technology in automotive. So Mario, maybe somebody comes uh, uh, here during during the sure. presentation. So uh, here is our students from the faculty from the department. This is your auditorium, and now and uh, you can start uh, with a presentation here for 90 minutes Ma okay. uh, presentation so welcome and enjoy from the lesson and i hope uh, you prepare some questions uh, to the end uh, to the discussion so if you will have something interesting uh, don't hesitate to ask uh, uh, right question to the to the end of the, of the lesson so. thank you very much thank you very much uh, peter uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here today. My name is Mario Hirtz and um, I, I will give a 90 minutes lecture about the automotive electronics and sensor systems. And I will focus especially on sensors for autonomous driving uh, because this is one of the yeah, very relevant research topics today we have in automotive industry. Uh, so uh, Professor Baxan told me that you are all students of electrical engineering, right? That's great. And this is a lecture about lighting technologies. So I, I'm not the expert in lighting, but I would like to show you some applications today about lightings in automotive. Some words about my person. Uh, so I'm initially a mechanical uh, engineer. So I've studied mechanical engineering. Uh, I hold a PhD uh, in the area of internal combustion engine and emission reduction. Uh, and uh, this time I'm associate professor at the Institute of Automotive Engineering uh, at Graz University of Technology. Uh, we do a lot of research together, research and development together with automotive industry, with supplier uh, in the area of um, alternative powertrains of so-called automotive mechatronics, so electronic systems in cars. And in this field, I will give this talk today. My research topics here are related to sustainable transportation, alternative powertrains, electric propulsion, but also, of course, mechatronic systems. Um, just some words to myself. Uh, I'm an uh, associate professor in, in my university in Graz, but I also have a lecture at Tongji University in Shanghai, in China. Uh, this Tongji is a very famous university in, in, in China, where we also have a student exchange program. So I traveled to China since more than 20 years uh, 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 in the meantime. And I've been in the United States, in, in Florida, for some time at the university in Tampa. Uh, this time I also have a winter school in Bangkok. Uh, in January, it is very nice there because they have 30 degrees in, 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 in January in Bangkok uh, at King Mongkok's University. And so, as you see, I, I'm very international. I, I travel uh, a, a lot and, and I like to network with, with colleagues in different universities. And so I'm very happy to be uh, uh, here today with you and, and Professor Baksand. Okay, let's jump into the topic. And I will introduce uh, my lecture with the car as mechatronic system. What does mechatronic mean? Mechatronic uh, includes the combination of uh, electrical components, as you know very well, as electronics in the control system and mechanical components. So this is this combination of electronics, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering in, in the car. And here we have a large number of components. I have just written down them here. I will not read the, the slide in detail. It's in the area of propulsion systems, which combustion engine control, exhaust gas emission reduction, but also, of course, hello, come in, take a seat. Also, of course, in the area of hybrid drives, electric drives, control systems. We have uh, in comfort, air condition, speed control, 
different areas of, to make the car more comfortable. Very important area is communication. It's the so-called infotainment. So the modern car is connected to the internet and communicates and offers services. But this also provides opportunities for automated driving functions. I will come to that later, where car com are able to communicate with the infrastructure or uh, with other cars. And of course, very relevant is the area of safety. So uh, um, ABS, anti-lock braking system, or electronic stability control, but also more complex systems like brake uh, assistance or adaptive cruise control, lane, lane assist on the highway, and all these technologies are very much related to electronics in the car, to sensor systems, control systems. The relevance um, of um, electronics, uh, electrics, electronics in the car is shown here. When we look at a modern car, and it, it's just a standard car with combustion engine, we see that the value creation, value creation means the cost of production of a new car, more than 30% is related to electrics, electronics. And this is quite a huge share when we consider that we have the bodywork of the car and other mechanical components, the drivetrain, transmission, and so on. But in terms of costs and, and, and value creation, more than 30% we have in electrics electronics. You see here, this is just published by the German community of electric electronic engineers, so I think it's reliable. We see we have a strong increase here over the past decades. And when we look in the future, and when we consider electric cars, no combustion engine anymore, or even hybrid cars, uh, this share goes up significantly. So for electric car, we have more than 80% of value creation in a new car production uh, uh, is, is related to electrics electronics. In this way, I just want to point out electrical engineering, control system, sensor system, and also electronics is very important for the automotive industry. And when you will have finished your study here, you have good opportunities for, for great jobs because the automotive industry is looking for electrical engineers, for experts in the wild fields of applications. Uh, and here you really have good opportunities for jobs in the automotive industry. Okay, let's jump into the car as mechatronic system. How does it look like? Uh, this is an older picture, but I like it very much. It's from 2005, so Mercedes-Benz S-Class from 2005. And it shows the controller, the microcontroller. And looking at this car, we have 61 controller in this Mercedes S-Class, in this luxury car. And when we look at the new model, so the 2020 model of the S-Class, we have more than 100 controller in the car. So a car is a rolling computer. And all these controllers are connected. There are no standalone controller. And this is very important to understand when integrating electric components into cars. So of course, we have very different controller types. We have simple controller for the window lifter, for example, or seat adjustment. We have very complex controller, high performance computers for engine control or uh, safety uh, control features. So we have very different types of controller, but all of them are connected by different types of data connection. And here we distinguish the CAN bus, perhaps you've heard about the bus systems, the CAN bus. Um, FlexRay is very well known. Then we have an infotainment bus, the media oriented bus, a low cost bus, and also ethernet in car. I think you know Ethernet from your office applications. Uh, this also uh, comes into automotive because of the high performance capability. When we look at such a controller architecture, uh, it's organized. And it's organized according to the different clusters that we have in the car. Um, here, this is just a, a rough overview where we have each of these racked angles is one controller, one microcontroller, and they are organized, for example, in form of high-speed uh, uh, buses, high-speed um, um, data communication. 
with real-time capability. So this is used for powertrain or brake system or steering system. Here we need real-time data exchange, very fast, uh, high-performance data exchange. Then we have low-speed buses for comfort, seat adjustment or air condition system. We have some low-cost buses in addition. LIN is a low-cost uh, bus system for a door LIN with, with the central lock or something like that. In addition, we have the um, infotainment buses, and this is a special thing because uh, with the infotainment buses, we have connection to outside. So I talked about the car, a modern car, has access to, to internet, to wireless communication. That means we have here uh, interfaces that can have access to the car, where the car can communicate. This also can be done by uh, USB, just to, you plug in your smartphone in the car uh, or by Wi-Fi uh, connection. And with this possibility, we can uh, have, we can use the car for communication purposes. i come to that with them in a minute. All these buses are combined via a so-called data backbone or gateway. This is a central controller or controller architecture. And in that way, the systems can communicate. So for example, a microcontroller, this one can communicate uh, with the engine uh, uh, con controller. So we have a large exchange of data. This provides some risks in terms of data security. So this issue of cyber security becomes more and more relevant because you can imagine if uh, somebody has unintended access to one of these controller via Wi-Fi, for example, a hacker, there might be the possibility to, yeah, to control other systems in the car, which could be very dangerous because the car at the end can be a dangerous device if unintended access for the brake for the engine uh, uh, is provided. Therefore, much effort is driven to uh, protect the system. So firewalls, encryption, decryption, uh, and so on is, is provided to protect the system against unintended access from outside. So this is the architecture. And just uh, to mention, what's above this line is in the car. And what's below the, this line is uh, off-board. And the standard connection here is the so-called OBD, onboard diagnostics. It's a standardized plug. Most in all the cars you find this, uh, mostly in the area of the steering wheel or somewhere the driver can reach it. And here you can plug in, and this is used, for example, for uh, service tests or software updates. A car receives a new software, uh, production uh, flashing software, emission tests, application tools. Perhaps you have heard about this possibility. There are some Bluetooth dongle available. You can buy them in the internet, then you can plug in and can read out some data from your car. You don't have access to uh, adjust major features. This is protected, but you can read out some data from your car. Well, uh, if there are any questions, please interrupt me. Do, do you understand my, my talk? Is this English is fine for you? And do, 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 don't, uh, do I speak too fast or is this okay? So everything fine. If you have questions, just raise your hand and ask me immediately. Yeah, here are just some examples of typical applications of bus systems. I, I will not go in detail here. You, you will get the scripts uh, uh, as PDF file. So you, you will ha uh, have access to that. Uh, we see here this architecture with the gateway, with CAN buses. Typically we have more than one CAN bus in the car, two, th three, four, uh, depending on, on, the, on the complexity and, and on the price of the car at the end. Uh, we have uh, CAN bus applications. We have Ethernet. This is, I will come to that later, uh, for uh, automated driving functions. So driver assistance functions like radar system, camera system, and, and other systems that are related to communication in the car. Uh, we have flex ray, typically in the powertrain area and main vehicle dynamics domain. 
uh, we have USB, this is well known, and we have some low cost uh, buses for yeah, some not so important comfort features or adjustment features. Let's have a look a little bit more detailed into the controller uh, architecture of a, of a car. We see here in simplified representation the vehicle level. So uh, um, this is a car and we see here the different controllers in the bus A, B, C, D, all of them connected in the gateway. I told before, with this the controller can communicate with another controller, so exchange the data here. Uh, looking at more detailed now, so to look at one bus exemplary, have a, uh, a focus on that, we see here, this is bus B, it could be a CAN bus, where we have different controller here combined, the gateway and the possibility to, to communicate with the others. And in this example we have here the electronic stability program. We have a yaw rate sensor. Yaw rate sensors are acceleration sensors that measure the movement of the car. So if the car is oversteering or understeering. We have engine control, electronic parking brake, uh, a steering angle sensor that is required for dynamics uh, uh, calculation of the car and here some headlamp leveling, so related to the headlights, uh, the controller that controls the, the positioning of the headlights during the ride. And on the next slide I would like to go more detail to have a look into such a controller, so what's inside. And here we talk about embedded systems. So I have here two examples of uh, such controller. Um, what's on the PCB? This is a very simple example just to give you an idea what is in such a uh, controller architecture. We have here the CPU, the central processing unit. And this could be an exemplary controller of a window lifter or seat adjustment because it's a very simple one with just 35 instructions in this example. Uh, and we have here a memory area with, with RAM and ROM. Uh, we have a power supply, typically automotive uh, systems run about 3 to 4 volts uh, 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 voltage level. We have here uh, um, oscillators uh, and timers. They, they could be used for triggering uh, sensors so to provide the operating frequency for uh, uh, sensor systems or measurement systems. We have here AD converter, I think you, you all know that as electrical engineer, analog digital converter. Uh, we have here a pulse width modulation, PWM signal for control of an electric motor for example. And we have a number of interfaces, input and output ports. Yeah, that's it, such a controller and I will show you an example of a real controller. Uh, typically has a cost of some, some euros uh, uh, in, in, in the mass production. When we talk about a window lifter or s some simple devices, a pump control. Most of these uh, um, controller architectures are using uh, micro uh, controllers. Microcontrollers are um, elements which provide the, a large range of these functions on one chip. So it's very compact design. Where you see here, this is one chip. And we have these functionalities I was talking about before with the CPU, with the memory, with some basic functions uh, uh, um, here, and also the interfaces. So input output ports, uh, um, analog digital converter, digital analog converter on one chip. And this is very compact and even more cost effective than the PCB example I've shown you before. You, you find these microcontroller architectures in a large range of applications, not only in automotive. So when you look inside the, your smartphone, don't do it because then you have to reassemble it. <laughs> but here inside you find some microcontroller for different purposes, for uh, main controller, for communication, perhaps one for uh, a camera system, uh, and others, so it's more or less standard. I, I talked about hardware, so um, these are examples of, of controller hardware, but also important of course is software, for sure. 
And in automotive, we have um, very structured software modules for the so-called embedded systems. So an embedded system um, is a system that is specifically developed for one application. Uh, I, I jump forward in, in my slides here. Here I have an example of an embedded system. This is a throttle controller. So uh, uh, in, in the combustion engine, when we put the gas pedal, the throttle uh, opens to control the airflow into the combustion engine. And this is done by such a device, so electronically controlled with an electric motor. And what we see here in this embedded system is that it's an enclosed system where everything is here provided inside this box. So we have here, uh, for example, the electric motor. The electric motor drives this uh, um, push rod here uh, via a, a, a warm gear or a thread gear. So the mechanical part, the electrical part with the motor. And of course, we have the controller here with some uh, uh, units. I don't go into detail uh, of the microcontroller and so on everything in one housing, we have as an interface data communication, the CAN bus, and power supply, and that's it. This is built in on the combustion engine and it works, but it works only for the specific task it is developed for. This makes embedded systems different from laptops, for example, or workstations. So embedded systems are specifically developed um, mechatronic, electronic systems. They include software and hardware. Uh, I will talk about software in a minute. I just want to finish the explanation about embedded systems. Embedded systems you also have at home. Do you have some ideas where you have embedded systems at home? Give me some ideas. Washing machine. Washing machine, absolutely right. Washing machine, dishwasher, microwave, your smartphone is a complex, but it is an embedded system. And the difference to a laptop is, or a workstation, you can use the workstation for a broad range of application. With the laptop, you can work with Microsoft Word, you can browse in the internet, you can run simulation. So it's a universal device. An embedded system is not a universal device. The embedded controller of your washing machine you cannot use for your refrigerator. It's not possible, it's really tailored. And the same we have in automotive. We have a number of embedded systems that are very specifically developed. In this example, uh, or in this way, I just can jump back to my slide in the beginning. No, I had it here, let me see. I go back. When we look at this car, we have in this example, 61 embedded systems, and we cannot exchange it. When the controller of the seat breaks down, we cannot replace it by the window lifter. Do you have an idea why this is the case? Why the automotive industry or many product in industry uses specifically developed embedded systems for the different tasks? What, what could be the reason for that? Right. Yeah, the costs, thank you. It's cheap because they are very much tailored for the specific task, then they are produced in mass production in large volume, and this is cheap. Thank you very much. This is the reason for that. And in such an embedded system, of course, the software is very important. And here I just have one slide about automotive software, uh, because it's more or less standardized. So in, in a car, the car manufacturer prescribes the structure of the software. And there are different platforms available and the, perhaps the most popular one or well-known is the so-called Autosa platform. So this is a standard platform of automotive software. And I, I will not go too much into detail, but in general, it consists of a so-called operating system with standard modules. In an analogy, this can be compared with Windows on your laptop. So it's the basic system, uh, and uh, application software or functional software, which is performing the dedicated tasks. So in an analogy, 
this can be compared with Excel or Firefox or uh, another program you run on the laptop. It's just an analogy. Uh, and here we have in the operating software, we have the basic system, operating system, we have communication, so the data exchange, we have different drivers, we have the microcontroller abstraction, so everything to make the system run. And on top, then we have the specific application software. And when you are, for example, working in the supplier industry, uh, in lighting industry, for example, then you will develop the specific uh, software application for the control of your product, in perhaps the headlights or some automated light regulation, a matrix light that is uh, able to detect the uh, uh, areas that should be uh, uh, lighted uh, or dynamic light that moves when you uh, drive around the corner, you have to develop here the different components. This could be, for example, um, the processing of video data, of camera data, that are required to capture the driving situation in front of the car. So this could be one module here. Or another module could be the control of the light direction. So, so when, when you direct the light during, during driving. In, in the, this way, the specific applications have to be developed according to the task uh, of, of the system. Software development, I will come to that later, regarding the process of software development, is a very challenging uh, uh, task uh, in the automotive industry because it's so complex. We, we had this example of 60 or more controllers. Each controller runs its software and they have to be interlinked and communicate with each other. So th this is a rather complex uh, task. Um, just uh, an outlook into the future regarding this structure of controllers in cars. And here we see a trend that goes into a reduction of number of controllers. So in the beginning, I introduced a modern car, more or less modern car, 2005, with 61 controllers. And I told you luxury cars today have even up to 100 controllers. But this trend is now going into another direction, namely to reduce the number of controllers. And the first car company that introduced this strategy was Tesla uh, with the, the Model S and then also later with the Model 3 and the Model Y. They did go another approach. They developed high-performance controller and implemented the different functionalities of formerly perhaps 20 separate microcontroller. They integrated into one high-performance controller. So it comes to some kind of centralization uh, and the number of controllers decrease. I have here uh, just some uh, numbers. The Tesla Model Y just has three main controllers. So three high performance main controllers that accomplish a number of demanding tasks, so power demanding tasks. And in total, including all the sensor ECUs and all the, the small uh, controllers that are in the cameras and, and, and whatever in the car, there are in total just 26 uh, microcontrollers. So it's a reduction of number of controllers. And also some other car manufacturer go into that direction. For example, Ford with the Mach-E or Volkswagen with the new electric car platform. Uh, and I think this, this is a, a future trend uh, that demands uh, a change in the development process. Uh, I just jump back to my diagram of the traditional controller architecture. In the traditional way, the supplier industry delivers the component plus the microcontroller. So when we have, for example, uh, a transmission, a gearbox manufacturer, automated gearbox, then the supplier uh, uh, de develops and delivers the automated gearbox plus the controller here. And the electronic or data exchange is defined by the interface via the bus system. And this can be done 
in a clear way because it can be clearly defined which data the transmission controller will receive and which data should be sent during the different driving situations. So it's a very clear uh, um, interface here defined. Uh, this is status of the art as it was done the last decades. When we have now uh, a lower number of controllers, like Tesla does, this system would be integrated in, in a functionality cluster that covers a number of different components in the car and that covers uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of functions. And now the supplier cannot develop standalone. The supplier must be integrated into the development process of the cluster controller, of the high-performing controller. And this is a challenge. It has turned out that for traditional drivetrains, so for cars with combustion engine, it does not work. Mainly because the supplier don't want to communicate or to develop in such a close cooperation on the electronic system. So I think that for cars with combustion engines or for hybrid cars, we will not go away from this traditional structure. But for electric cars, where we have complete new vehicle architecture and drivetrain architecture, we will see increasingly the central zonal uh, um, architecture of controller. And this will be also relevant for you when you work in this business, for example, in a lighting industry or you work in a company that develops ABS systems or other systems for the car, you will be required to integrate into the complete controller or main controller development. So it will not be a standalone um, process as it has been before. I think that the next generation and next next generation of electric cars for sure will have these central architectures. What was the motivation uh, of Tesla to go into that direction? The one is costs. Uh, at the end, it's cheaper because we reduce the number of bus systems of communication uh, uh, and we reduce the number of hardware uh, in the car. And the second is it's more performant. If it's done right, uh, the, the high performance controller um, deliver much more effective the information, the processing and all that is done inside. And this is necessary for driver assistance function. So when we think about, and I will show you later in the lecture, uh, um, some examples of uh, camera data processing, laser based, so LiDAR, laser sensor data processing, and the data fusion of this huge amount of information that we need for driver assistance function, we need powerful controllers. And therefore, Tesla had this very good idea to develop central controller, which are able to deal with these tasks, with these challenges. And besides, they integrate other functions, uh, uh, under other functionalities, other operations into that. Okay, so far to that um, introduction, to that overview of, of, of the car as mechatronic system. Do you have some questions or remarks? Not so far. Did you learn about that in your study? Is this, or was this new or did you hear about that before in, in, in lectures? Mainly new. It's mainly new, okay. Yeah, great, great. Then I'm happy to, to uh, show you this as introduction. Regarding automotive mechatronic systems, so I, I talked about embedded systems, and I think I have here another slide, another example here. So embedded systems uh, include controller plus sensor plus actuator, the complete system. This is also the case in, uh, when we think about main controller architectures, but in that case, it goes more into the direction of the architectures that we have in workstations or, or laptops. So it, it's some kind of yeah, transition to, to that more complex systems. In general, how does it look like, such functionality of embedded systems? I think you all know this, this is a, a closed loop control cycle, right? Uh, I think you had this in control engineering in your study. So I don't need to explain that in detail, but 
I want to point out some aspects that we have in automotive. So we have the, the control unit. We have here an interface where the driver can uh, uh, define some data or some desired behavior of the system. We have data communication with other uh, controller. We have the actuator uh, that acts on, on, on the basic system. We have influencing factors. And in case of a closed loop control, we have sensors that give a feedback loop. And the control strategy then can be applied in different ways as a PID structure or P controller, D controller, or some other types of controller you have learned in control engineering. Uh, just to give you an example for a practical application, um, let's take uh, cruise control. I think everybody knows cruise control. Uh, with this, you can adjust the speed of your car. So when you drive on a highway, let's say 100 kilometers per hour, uh, uh, the manual operator, the driver, would define the desired speed of 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, the motor controller uh, controls the actuator, which is the engine. In case of a combustion engine, the combustion engine or electric motor. Uh, uh, so uh, controls the actuators to achieve a certain speed. Energy is supplied. In case of combustion engine, it's fuel. In case of electric car, it, it's electricity. And so the actuator delivers the power on the basic system, which is the car, to drive 100 kilometers per hour. The speed is measured by the speed sensor and feed back uh, uh, to the uh, controller to, to adjust it correspondingly. When we go uphill, the speed will decrease because of the higher driving resistances. This reduction of speed is measured in the sensor uh, and the controller increases the power output to keep the speed constant, 100. And when we go downhill, it's the other way around. So it's a closed loop control cycle. It's typically applicated uh, uh, in many, in many uh, uh, air uh, functions uh, in the car. Another example I would like to give um, for uh, embedded systems is the electronic stability program. Um, th this example I like to show because it's very compact. The electronic stability program, what does it do? Uh, does somebody know the, the functionality of ESP? Yeah, some of you. It, it controls the driving dynamics of the car. And uh, it is... Um, an active system, that means it even works if the driver is not pushing the brake pedal. So that's the difference to ABS. Just to explain very quickly, how does it work? Uh, here I have a simple example of driving around the corner. Uh, and in the upper uh, um, example, it's without ESP. So a driver is driving into a corner. Perhaps it's cold outside and a little bit slippery. And because it's too fast, the car starts to oversteer. And this might be dangerous, there might be an accident because of this oversteer. With ESP, uh, with ESP, the system identifies the moving direction of the car, the oversteering movement of the car in a very early stage. This is identified by use of acceleration sensors in the car that measure the acceleration in all three directions of the coordinate system in the car. And with this, they can detect there is a tendency of oversteering, for example, here. And if this is detected, the, the system actively breaks some wheels. Not all wheels, but only those wheels that are necessary to stabilize the car. And in this example, so when we drive into the corner too fast, we have an oversteering tendency. It helps to break the outside front wheel of the car. With this, a Contra force is an opposing force, opposing force is uh, applied so that with this movement the car is then stabilized because of this force here, this braking force. This is done with a very high accurately and in most cases the driver does not feel, really feel a lot. Uh, it just keeps the car in track. In case that the car is still too fast or the driver does not release the gas pedal, there might be a contra-movement because of this force. So 
At first we have an oversteering behavior, then the force is applied and this would lead to an understeering behavior and the system identifies this and breaks perhaps the other wheel some time steps later. And this is done with a very high frequency, typically with yeah, 5 hertz, 10 hertz, 15 hertz. Uh, uh, so to control the car around driving the corner. The driver himself or herself believes he or she is a very good driver, but it's done by electronics, the stabilization of the car. Uh, this is just one example of how ESP works. There are many other driving situations where uh, it's very helpful. And what I wanted to point out with this slide is how integrated the systems are realized. So we see here the ESP unit. Uh, it consists of the, of the controller unit here in black. Uh, there is an electric motor that provides the pump pressure for the hydraulic brake system. Uh, there is a block with a number of valves for controlling, for modulating the brake pressure for each wheel at the car separately. So a high complex uh, configuration and the control unit, the embedded system. And when we look here inside, we see that it, it's a closed system with everything required we see here in the system. We have the, the PCB, so the board with the processors. We have here the, the sensor plate with the acceleration sensors, the yaw rate sensors. Um, we have here uh, interfaces, uh, for example, the wheel speed sensors deliver data are required, or the CAN bus communication to exchange data with, with the combustion engine, because in case we have a ABS braking, we need to reduce the power from the combustion engine. So this is done here, and we have the power amplifiers, the output to control the valves here and, and the pump. That size of this is about yeah, like this here, so like a cigarette box or something like that, a small one. And it's a standard component that is delivered completely and built in somewhere in the middle of the car uh, uh, to the bodywork to, to um, measure this dynamics very accurately. So it's just an example of a modern uh, embedded system uh, in, in automotive applications. Some questions regarding ESP? No? Yeah, uh, as next, I would like to talk about the development process. I, I will not go into detail here too much, but I would like to introduce uh, the development process. So here at first, how a car is developed, so the complete vehicle development process. And after that, I would like to talk about the electronics or mechatronic systems development. I just take a water. Oh, pardon. It's explosive. <laughs> um, anyway, this slide gives a rough overview of a complete full vehicle development, so development of a car, where we have five main areas. We have the uh, definition phase, the characteristics of the car are set here. We have some kind of concept phase and pre-development phase. We have a serious development with the detailed development and then the pre-serious and, and the production. Here it starts the production. What do you think, uh, how long does it take to develop a new car? So when we start here with the, with the definition of the vehicle characteristics until start of production, of mass production of the car, how long does it take? Five years, that's a good estimation. So Audi, for example, has a five years process. BMW, I think four years, something like that. This is a typical time range. For a dev deviation of an existing model into a convertible or a dairy weight, it might be quicker. But for the development of a complete car, about five years is a good estimation. Thank you. How much does it cost to develop a, a new car? What's the investment for a car manufacturer to, to develop a new car? Some ideas? Give me a number. Pardon? 
oh, it's much, much more. It's in the range of billions. So 10 to the power of nine uh, uh, euros, not millions, billions. Uh, just to give you a number, uh, Volkswagen published that the development of the Golf 8, which is the actual Golf model, uh, was an investment of 1.8 billions. Um, and here we had the Golf 7 as a predecessor model, so it was not a complete new development. Uh, or BMW published some years ago that the development of this electric car, this i3, do, do, do you remember this compact electric car of BMW, uh, was an investment of more than 3.5 billion euro. So it's really a huge amount of money a uh, car manufacturer have to invest. And when we think on new technologies, like Volkswagen does it now with this shift to electric cars. Volkswagen has developed their electric vehicle platform where they produce now the ID3 and the ID4 and these dairy weights. So it's a platform for a number of different cars. Uh, the, the investment was announced by Volkswagen to be between 10 and 15 billion euro. So this is a huge amount of money. Uh, I just want to point out the importance of making the right decisions. And here in the definition phase, the characteristics of the new model are defined. So if we would be here in, in if, we, if we would be a car manufacturer and we would start today the definition of characteristics of a new car. So the size of the car, the powertrain technology, the cost, the car should cost later in the market, um, different technologies to implement it, the type of the car, is it the SUV or a sports car or whatever. All these characteristics are defined here. And if we would start that today, it's end of 2022, the car will come into market in, let's say, about five years, as you mentioned. This would be end of 2027, right? Five years. It, it's the time we need for the development of the car. That means that we have to look into the future and we have to define the specifications of the new car to be developed here uh, in a way that it fulfills the requirements in 2027, 2028. And these specifications, for example, include legislative boundary conditions as a very important specification. Uh, it includes the customer taste and the customer demands. That means that we need to look into the crystal ball and estimate which cars will be sold successfully from 2028 on. So we have to get an idea, an understanding of what customer need and what they are willing to buy in five years. Also the same with legislative boundary conditions. So we have to consider which emission legislation is in 2028 or what are the restrictions regarding carbon uh, emissions, regarding crash and safety, regarding all the other aspects that might influence the production of our cars. Uh, and moreover, to make the story worse, you, you see, I see it on your faces, this is a tough job we have to do today. Uh, to make the story worse, how long is the car typically in the market? So which time is the, or what is the lifetime of a, of a car in the market as new car? How long do they stay in the market typically? four years, three years, sometimes there's a uh, facelift where there are again three or four years. So in total, a good estimation of a model in the market is about, let's say, two times of three years with a facelift, so six years, and some cars are even longer in the market, eight years or, or something like that. That means today we are end of 2022, our car will be produced from 2028 on, and then will be in the market to about 2035. And perhaps you have heard about, in 2035, there will be no combustion engine driven cars allowed to be sold in Europe, in new, no new cars. So 
if we would decide today to design, to develop a new car, we have to consider that that interferes with the European legislation that bans combustion engines. And this, of course, will influence the requirements, the characteristics of our model to be developed. With, with this, I just want to point out, so uh, don't worry, you, you don't need to design a new car now or to give the specifications, but I just want to point out this importance of long-term consideration when car manufacturers make their decisions. It's a lot of money. We talked about investment of several billions of euro. This money has to be earned because the car should be sold. This is the main way of car manufacturers to earn money. And in that way, very careful decisions have been made uh, by car manufacturers to, to be successful at the end. We have some examples of not successful cars. So when we look in the past, uh, there were several car models not so successful as expected, and uh, they, they did not pay back. So the, it, it was not a black color or black number business, so it was not a good business uh, for the car manufacturer if they did not um, evaluate the future development uh, uh, correctly. Okay, yeah, so with this, the definition phase, I just wanted to point out here and under these uh, uh, aspects. Okay, the, the rest uh, of the slide, I will not go into detail. Uh, it's just for your information. So there are numbers of steps uh, performed on full vehicle level, vehicle layout, module specification, system development of all the components and modules in the car, the drive, train, the steering system, the electronics, whatever. Uh, then the detailed design and simulation, component design, prototyping and testing. We have then uh, here the, the supplier integration, production, manufacturing, and, and, and so on. This uh, process that I have shown you here is a so-called stage gate process. This is the standard program management process that is very common, uh, where we have typically uh, working stages and then gates where we check where we prove if the working stages have been successful. So if all the requirements have been implemented successful. Of course, it's not so simple as shown here. It's more uh, like here where we have a number of parallel and overlapping processes. But this is the management view. Uh, if you will be involved into electronic systems and mechatronic systems development, you will also uh, work with the so-called V model. The V model is a specific process for mechatronic systems development um, that has been established to deal with the or to handle the complexity of mechatronic systems development. Here just a question, did you learn about the V model? Is, is this known here or should I explain it? No, I, I will give a short introduction. The, the V model initially comes from software development where we initially have the waterfall model. For sure, you know the waterfall model. It's one process step after another uh, where we have at the beginning the requirement specification, system design, system implementation, verification and test, then the deployment and the use of the product in that example here, the, the software. And the V model just was built by flipping this integration, verification, and confirmation part upwards into a V form. Why has this been done? Because there are analogies and influencing factors um, from the testing and integration onto the design. So there is a certain feedback, and with this V shape, we just can visualize it. In, in a nice way. This is a German, I'm sorry about this is a German slide, but I have taken it originally from the German uh, industry standard 20, uh, 2206, which describes this V model very accurately. It's also available in English, so don't worry. 
uh, but uh, it's originally from the standard there, it's in German, but I also have prepared uh, an English explanation. Uh, yeah, it's here. And I would like to give you an example just for understanding how this V model works or how it is applied. Uh, it starts with the specifications and it starts with the system level. So we have here the specifications on top level. Um, just as example, let's, hmm, it, it's a simple example, but just for explanation, let's talk about um, the development of a gearbox, an automated transmission for a car. Uh, that is done at the supplier, so a gearbox supplier. Uh, and here it starts with the specification on full vehicle level. So uh, those data, those requirements that are relevant for the car in view of the gearbox are defined here. So this includes, for example, um, the driving performance, the speed, the acceleration of the car, the fuel consumption, and all these parameters that are defined on system level, on, on the complete car level. And the next step, uh, it goes down into detail to the module level. In my example, it's the gearbox. And derived from the main specifications, now are the requirements for the, for the module development. So for example, this could include the number of gears in the gearbox or the shifting algorithms, uh, or uh, perhaps the um, friction optimization, so the friction in the gears, in, in the gearbox, or the space and weight of the gearbox, efficiency, and these issues are derived here as requirement for the development of the gearbox. Here, on this next level, module level, the gearbox system is developed and that under integration of the different disciplines, mechanics, electrics, electronics, and software. This is done in parallel uh, in the domain of systems engineering. So we use here the typical tools and methods for system engineering. So for example, uh, uh, um, these system design approaches, we do perhaps MATLAB simulations or simulation in, in uh, uh, tools to, to optimize the behavior uh, of the gearbox and we lay out the complete gearbox design according to, to the specifications made before to fit into the car. In the next step we go into component design. So here for example based on the system design we develop the gear wheels, the clutches on the mechanical side. Uh, on the electrical side we develop or integrate sensors, actuators, electric motor for, for shifting the gears, for example. And on the software side, we integrate uh, the, the functionalities for the controller. This is done so from system to module to component in detail. Important here is always the interaction of the different disciplines because there might be uh, an influence of mechanics on electrics and software. So for example, in mechanics, when we develop certain clutch materials or friction behavior, we have to consider that in the actuator, electric actuator, but also in the software. On the right branch uh, of the V model, it comes to testing and integration. So we do here on the lower level at first component testing. We make sure that all the components work right. This is a circular process, of course, in the different disciplines. So mechanically testing, perhaps by finite element simulation, testing of electrical systems, testing of software. Software is often higher frequent uh, here in this process. Then we go up and assemble the uh, components to the gearbox, to our system. At first, only in virtual on the computer, later on the test bench. And here we also perform continuous testing. If there are some issues here, some problems, we have to go back into the system design to modify and then go back in the cycle again. Finally, we have developed our gearbox. It works on the test bench very well. Then we build it in into the vehicle. And in the vehicle, we again perform tests in real life conditions. We drive on the road or off road or whatever. Uh, and if there are troubles, we have to go back to the to change the specifications 
and then go through again through all disciplines because a change of specification might affect all three different disciplines in, involved. So this has to be proved, this has to be checked. And finally, when we have fulfilled all the requirements, then we go into the confirmation of the product in the car. So this is the, let's say, behavior of the V model to go from requirements, from specifications, to system design, to detail design, and then on the right side of the V model, we do testing and integration and build, connect the, the, the uh, different components and models together. Okay, so it, it's just that you have heard about that. Uh, um, it might be a topic, so when you are in complex mechatronic system development or automotive, it's a standard process. Questions or remarks? Everything clear with my explanation? Okay, thank you. Well, uh, last slide about this um, theory or this rather boring stuff, then I will go to autonomous driving. This will be more exciting. Uh, but what, what is the challenge and that we have in our process landscape in the project? The integration of the V model into the standard processes. So, because it's a different characteristics. In the state gauge processes, we have a linear processes, often in parallel, but linear. In the V model, we have cyclic processes. And this integration is often challenging. And the engineers always fight with project management because of that. So it's, it's yeah, typical in, in our modern development processes. Okay, and now to the last chapter I will uh, uh, introduce today. Yeah, we have got half an hour, that, that's fine in timing. Um, it's about um, automated driving autonomous driving, and I would like to point out uh, in this chapter what is the challenge, what are the different levels of driver assistance functions, and then I have some uh, examples of sensors, and this is related to also to lighting technologies, because sensors are used for object recognition, object identification. Yeah, autonomous driving is an idea since decades, but uh, it's not in mass production yet. I will show you some examples of vehicles that still are on public road, but most of them vehicles are special purpose vehicles. So we do not have this technology available for everyday use or every car use. But of course, it, it has some motivation. So traffic safety and improvement of traffic safety, perhaps you know that most accidents happen because of human error. And if we can provide a system that uh, um, works under all the boundary conditions that have, we have a strong support to reduce the number of accidents. Comfort, for sure, that's clear. Ecological motivations, yeah, there are some. I will discuss them later. It can be assumed that autonomous cars drive more efficient. Um, but there are some contrasts here because when we have autonomous cars available, we will use them more. You, you can send the autonomous car to the supermarket to bring home what you purchased, or you can send them with the children to football training, whatever, you don't need to sit in the car. That means mm, it is expected if this technology really comes on public road and, and is affordable for everybody, there might be a higher number of mileage or kilometers driven on the roads, which is not so good for the environment at the end because of energy consumption of traffic and so on. So I will discuss this. Mobility for all, it's clear, and economic motivations. And this, of course, is an important driver. So uh, I will show you on the next slides, most of the companies that invest much into that technology, of course, have business cases in the background. They want to earn money. That's, that's very simple, the, the main reason. I, I'll show you examples later. Okay, yeah, um, it is driven by tech companies and some car manufacturers. That's also an interesting issue, and I will jump forward here just to give you some examples. So what are main players today in autonomous driving? First one, it's Google. 
uh, Google has a spin-off that is called Waymo. I will show you that car in a minute more detailed. They are seen as the company with the most knowledge today in the field of autonomous driving. So Waymo, for example, operates a taxi fleet uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, where everybody can, every person can order a Waymo taxi and there is no driver inside. So it's really driverless car. You order it by smartphone and it's a taxi service. A friend of mine lives there and he continuously sends me videos how he uses the Waymo car. Uh, since this year, I think Waymo also has in San Francisco a taxi service without a driver. Then there are some other companies. Apple is doing a lot of research here. Zooks, this is a spin, uh, uh, not a spin off, a startup company. Uh, it was funded, I think, eight years ago by an Australian guy who came from advertising business. This guy had no ideas of cars, but he had the vision to develop an autonomous taxi. Look like this. And uh, last year, the company was bought by Amazon for $1.3 billion. So from zero to $1.3 billion in eight years. This is a success story, I, I would say. Anyway, uh, I have then linked some videos. Uh, you can watch them in, in YouTube or in the internet, how this, how this works. Canoe, Neuro is very successful. They have developed a delivery service for foods and goods delivery. It's in operation in, in Mountain View in California. Uh, Uber and some others. Uh, Navia is a European company, a French one with, with buses. Uh, and of course, car manufacturers are involved here. So the traditional one, Mercedes, Volkswagen, BMW, Volvo, whatever, and Tesla. Tesla is a special case uh, because Tesla um, does a very, let's say, um, straightforward advertising strategy. They call their driver assistance function, autopilot. Whereas it is not an autopilot, you can use it as a support, but it's not allowed to read a newspaper or something like that. You have a Tesla Model S. It's a very good auto, uh, support system. It's one of the best, I have to say, but it's not the autopilot. Uh, and even more, they, to, last year, I think it was beginning of last year, they released in the United States a new software update they call it full self-driving mode. But it is not a full self-driving mode, it's just an advanced driver assistance system. So they have a little bit, uh, let's say, straightforward uh, um, um, taking words or taking names, very, very visionary, but at the end it is not an automated driving function. We test them continuously, I just have tested the Tesla full self-driving mode, it works good but uh, it does not work for 100%. So I would have died if I would not interact. <laughs> uh, I would not stand here today. And unfortunately, accidents happen. So especially with, with uh, a Tesla, but also with other cars. Uh, and this is one example you find in the internet in Taiwan. When you look in, in YouTube for Tesla accident Taiwan, you find this and I have put it on the slide because nobody was hurt. So this was a lucky situation. Uh, what happened here? Um, a truck with Chinese breakfast food had a rollover on a highway. So it, it was independent from the Tesla. It just had an accident and had rolled over. And this truck was full with these Chinese breakfast boxes, these plastic boxes. And the Tesla Model 3 came along on the highway driving in this driver assistance mode, and the driver was reading a newspaper and the, was not watching on the road. And all this scenario was filmed by a traffic camera. And this movie is in the internet, you can watch that. And you see the truck is li lying at the side and the truck driver is standing about 100 meters in front and, and is waving, warning the other cars that the truck had in a rollover, nobody was hurt. But the Tesla did not recognize that because the color of the truck roof was nearly the same as of the sky behind. So there was no optically, um, um, how is it called, contrast sufficiently. This is based on lighting and vision. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, camera system could not identify 
the truck because it had the same color as the, as the sky in the back. And the radar system that was in use that time did not react because the roof is very soft. There was not sufficient re uh, reflection. And in that way, the Tesla crashed into the truck, but nobody was hurt because of this Chinese breakfast box, which are very soft. So they, they damped the crash, and therefore I, I, I did put it on my slide because nobody was hurt, and I can tell the story. If you want to see the movie, you find it in YouTube or, or whatever uh, with Tesla accident Taiwan, something like that. It was about one, one and a half year or so ago. Unfortunately, uh, um, other accidents were with, with, with bad, much worse results. People died. So, for example, last year, um, two guys died, died in a Tesla Model Y while driving this full self-driving mode. And both died, and there was a big investigation by the uh, Californian uh, um, government because they wanted to find out, is this full self-driving mode dangerous? Should we forbid it? Should we stop that? Uh, and the, uh, the investigation showed that both men, it was two, two men, were sitting at the rear seat. So they activated the full self-driving mode and then they went on the rear seat. So, so they went back to the rear seat and did sit there and the, the car then crashed. I think it was a tree or something like that because of an error in object recognition, and unfortunately both died. But it, it was not the primary problem of, of the car, because even in full self-driving mode, you have to supervise it. You are not allowed to sit on the rear seat, sleep, or whatever. It's not an autonomous driving function. Yeah, and there are some more accidents that happened. By the way, the highest level today in mass production cars uh, has Mercedes. They have uh, homologated and brought into their cars uh, with January this year a level three automation. So level three autonomous driving mode. And uh, now I come to the levels. I, I want to explain them to you. What does it mean? Level three is here. I, I just start for explanation with, with the first levels. Um, I have to say level one and level two uh, we, we need the supervision of the human driver. So level one, level two, therefore I have this red line here. Uh, we, we need that the human driver is responsible. Level one is in mass production since 15 years, something like that. This is just uh, uh, adaptive cruise control. So you, you know adaptive cruise control? It works with a radar sensor in front of the car and when you drive the car on the highway, for example, and you approach a car that is slower than yours, the distance is measured and the car will reduce the speed and then drive uh, after the car in front with a certain distance, adaptive cruise control. It's in mass production. Uh, another system on level one is lane assist. So it's just the, the curving uh, uh, sensor or the camera that identify the driving lane and when you leave the driving lane, you get a warning or the steering wheel is, is whatever, making a noise and the car tries to steer to keep the lane. These are level one functions in mass production. Level two function uh, include the combination of both adaptive cruise control and lane assist. It's called, it's called a, some common factor call it highway pilot. So here you have a system that controls the speed if necessary and keeps the lane. I have to say it's in mass production, but in, it's not fully reliable. So in case of bad light conditions or reflections on the road with the sunlight, or in case of rainy conditions where light is reflected, it does not operate very stable. So the driver has to supervise. Level three is the first level where the system takes over responsibility, and this changes everything. Because if an accident occurs, the car manufacturer will be punished and not the driver. So this is a, a huge step under different aspects, legislative boundary conditions, uh, um, insurance uh, uh, boundary conditions, all these aspects have to be considered here. And the Tesla is a level two system, perhaps level two and a half, because it works very good, but the driver is in the loop. 
Level 3 was introduced the first time in a mass production car by Mercedes-Benz in this year for the luxury cars, but only for restricted driving conditions. It only is allowed to be used on the highway at a speed of below 60 kilometers per hour. So on the highway below 60 kilometers per hour, <laughs> this means it's, it's intended in traffic jams. So when you are on a highway, on a city highway, for example, where you have a traffic jam up to 60 kilometers per hour, you can read a newspaper. It's allowed, you can do that. You can drive your smartphone, whatever. You don't have to watch the traffic. But of course, it's a big challenge because let's say if there occur some events which the system cannot handle, uh, an accident in front of the car or a ice rain or heavy snow or whatever, then the system has to switch off and warn the driver so that the driver uh, takes over. And you can imagine, this is, this is critical because when I read my newspaper in the car, I need at least 20 seconds to put away the newspaper, then to look at the road to identify the situation and then to do the right, uh, the right uh, reaction. This time is not given. Uh, I think the Mercedes gives you three seconds or something like that. Uh, so you have to be in attention. If there is a beep, you have to throw the newspaper out of the window and accurately and very quickly react on that and, and interact. So level three in general is the first step where the system takes over in certain driving situations, uh, but it's not really auto automated driving. It's just for specified situations. Level four is fully automated. Level four system, no takeover of the driver is required anymore. That means that the system at the first must, must be able to handle all situations, accidents, ice, rain, fog, snow, whatever might happen. Uh, and if the system breaks down or if the system has a problem, it has to go in the safe state mode. Typically, it is drive on the right side and stand still. This is a safe state mode. So this has to be provided by, by a level four system. This level four system cars uh, still have a steering wheel, uh, so it can be driven manually, but in most cases, it should work really autonomously. Level five is a robot. A level five car does not have steering wheel, no paddles, nothing. It's a robotic system. Uh, that is just a transportation device. So it's for people mover, transporting people, or goods transportation, something like that. In case that the level five system has a problem, it also goes into a safe state mode, uh, and typically then it's um, driven back to the service station uh, by remote control. So there is an operator in the office with the cameras, with all the system, the car then is driven home, let's say, by, by remote. Yeah, I, I will show you some examples of, of these vehicles. This is the Waymo car. Uh, uh, no, not the Waymo, the Sooks car, pardon. As you see, it's some kind of yeah, uh, uh, public traffic uh, uh, um, style, like in a tramway or something like that. You just access by the door. You, you control it with your smartphone. You call it with the smartphone, it's similar as Uber, Uber taxi. You control it with the smartphone, you pay with the smartphone. It's an inner city uh, yeah, moving device or transportation device. By the way, when you have the, the scripts in PDF, I have here some links with nice videos of, of the Waymo car, of the Sooks car, and, and there are some, some applications of that. Um, Autonomous driving is also relevant for logistics. So not only for people moving, but also for goods moving. Uh, and uh, here I have some examples. Um, well known is it in industrial processes. So still today we have in production and logistics or these Amazon robots. Uh, 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 perhaps you have seen some videos about that. They, they have this since more than 10 years. And they, they are really uh, uh, impressive. They, they move the goods with a high speed in these large warehouses of Amazon. Uh, they, they move the goods around and they never have collisions or accidents. 
So it works. Autonomous driving in a closed environment works very well. But the challenge is to transfer that in a public or real environment as we have in our cities where we always have pedestrians, cats and dogs, old women and children, a driver, manual driver, whatever. And this interaction is, is the big challenge that we have with autonomous driving implementation. If in this area of the robots, a human would walk in, it's a disaster. They have to immediately stop because they cannot estimate where the human will go to. And so the, the system stands if there is excess over the red line uh, by humans because of safety reasons. Okay, there are some other applications. Uh, for example, we had a project, I will show the video tomorrow, uh, from our project with a post delivery vehicle. We have developed in my university together with colleagues automated post delivery. And we have tested it in the inner city of, of Graz, of my city. Uh, and very successful. T tomorrow I, I will show a video uh, about that. So there are different applications uh, here uh, with autonomous delivery services. In the last part, um, I would like to talk about sensors. Which sensors do we need for driver assistance functions? So ADAS means Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. So these are the five steps that I have talked before about autonomous driving. We need vision sensors for object recognition and uh, object identification. Then we need uh, different onboard sensors for driving dynamics, so vehicle speed, acceleration, uh, and other conditions of the car. Also temperature sensor, rain sensor, um, friction sensor of the, between tire and road. And we need uh, external communication for positioning. So we need to identify the position of our car in the digital map uh, and communication. Uh, I would like to go in, in the last section of my lecture today a little bit more detailed into the vision systems uh, because they are related to light, to vision, to lighting, identification of object. And here, we have three main types. The first one is the camera systems. The camera systems capture um, pictures uh, in, in a time sequence, so videos, and then it's about software to identify the objects. Uh, the software development, I have some slides a little bit later, is mainly, or the software is mainly based on artificial uh, intelligence, so deep learning, machine learning approaches, because we have a huge amount of data. There is nearly infinity traffic scenarios possible. And uh, 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 in this way, we have to process a huge amount of data. And this is a, a good uh, uh, application for machine learning approaches. Then we have radar sensors. Radar sensors are in use in mass production cars for the adaptive cruise control, for example, since years. And we have laser sensors. Uh, laser sensors are the highest sophisticated and most expensive parts. Uh, and they deliver a very accurate three-dimensional picture of the environment. I have some images to, to show you. Here, here is just, before I jump into the sensors, here is just um, one example of such autonomous driving research car. It's the Waymo car. I have to say, um, this car is on the roads in California and, as I said, uh, in Phoenix, in Arizona, with special permission. So it's not really a mass production car. It's some kind of in between a real application, mass application and research vehicle. And Waymo invests billions uh, of, of euros or dollars uh, into that technology to test it on the road and to gather data uh, uh, for improving the software. Um, and ju just to have a look what's inside, um, we have here a number of cameras. So we have 28 cameras in total uh, in different positions at the front, at the side, at the rear. And all these camera images are merged. So it's a question of sensor combination or a sensor data fusion. 
Then we have LiDAR sensors. LiDAR are laser-based sensors. Uh, um, and the LiDAR sensors create a three-dimensional vision of the environment. I will show you a video in a minute. And uh, finally, we have radar sensors. Radar sensors create a very accurate information and re reliable information about the distance to other objects. I, I, will sh I will show you some videos so that you get an impression what do the sensors see. Here are just some pictures how they look in detail. But I would like to give you an impression. And here is my first video where we see um, a radar sensor. So a standard radar sensor, as it is applied in a car, in mass production car. Uh, this was a BMW, but this doesn't matter. And what I will start the video in a minute. What do you see here? You see here, this is the roof of the, of the Ego car where the camera is placed. And in front of this car is a radar sensor, a standard radar sensor. And there is another car driving in front. And uh, I will play the video and you will see the result um, of data processing of this radar sensor. And you will see here a number of rectangles appearing here. You will also see the driving lane. This is this double curve. This is calculated by the steering angle uh, of, of the car. And you will see that a number of these rectangles are not relevant for the driving path. So the software at the end has to filter out the relevant information. I, I started and then I can give some explanations. So the car approaches here on the highway, it, it's in the near Graz. And you see here a number of rectangles which are related to that what's beside here, not at the driving lane. And now you see the truck, it's the blue rectangle appearing. And another truck here, another blue rectangle. The pink one is the car in front. This is the, the, the car. Here is another truck uh, appearing here. So what radar sensor deliver is a very accurate information. I restart that in the mean. Uh, about the distance to another object or several objects, uh, but not information about the shape of the object or the type. We can estimate with the size that it could be a car or a truck or a bicycle, but we don't get detailed information. The big advantage of radar sensors is they are cheap and they are robust. So they work under rain, snow conditions, even in case of ice, but not too much. If there is a too large ice layer on the radar sensor, it will fall out. But a fog or whatever, uh, uh, it works very reliable and it delivers information. That's the reason why we use it for this adaptive cruise control. The next one I would like to show you is the camera. With the camera systems, here I have just summarized the main uh, facts of this. With the camera systems, we get a vision um, of the, what happens uh, uh, around the car. And um, cameras are the only technology that identify surfaces. So the color or the texture of a surface or if there is written down something, for example, a speed limit. That's the reason why we always need cameras. So even if we have radar, or laser sensors, we always need cameras. And here I would like to show you a video that was provided by Tesla. It was not provided by me, it was uh, provided some years ago in the development of this full self-driving mode, so in this project. And in this video, I started in a minute, you will see a lot of things. You will see a, a, a travel in, in California from Mountain View to another uh, uh, village where we have here the destination defined via GPS. This is a safety driver because it's a development project. There is a safety driver. He will not do anything. It's just for safety. You can read here the speed in miles per hour. And what's more interesting, you see here camera views. So this car is equipped with eight cameras. Three of them we see here. This is the most important one, the front camera. And then we have the left and right rearwards camera. 
And you will see when I start the video the different types of objects, how they are recognized. In green rectangles, objects that are relevant for the driving situation, for the driving path are indicated. In blue, the objects that are uh, identified but not relevant for the actual driving path. And then we have the pink color here for um, road lanes and for uh, traffic signs and other information that is relevant in terms of the traffic. I just have to go out of, YouTube, uh, of PowerPoint and start the presentation. Give me a second. Yeah, it works. So it, it's a six minutes uh, a video. I might uh, um, be faster, but just, just to show you, to give you an impression of what happens here. So the car drives out of the parking garage and then goes into the traffic and then it drives in, in, the, in the city and then a, a, a country road. You see the, the human safety driver does nothing. Uh, by the way, this is now in the status of this full self-driving mode. So uh, the development has finished two years ago and now they have this available in the full self-driving mode. And I have linked another uh, uh, video in the, in the PDF file in the slide, you'll find it, where it's a similar uh, video made with the latest version, but you do not see this object recognition. Therefore, I like this older video more. So it goes here. You see, it drives a little bit careful uh, uh, in terms of approaching to the crossings. Here you see the identification of the different objects, pedestrians, bicycles, cars. And it, it works rather good. So Tesla does really a good job here. This was the bicycle from before. So I tested this system in Europe and in the United States, and I have to say it works really good, but it works not for 100%. So I would not uh, uh, leave it alone, because there are always some situations where you have to interact, where you have to corrections. Yeah, this is now uh, uh, along the country road a bit, and yeah, so on. So due to the time, because we, we are short in time, I, I will finish the video. Are there questions from, from your side? I think it's clear. Yeah. This is a standard uh, two lane uh, two line in the center of the, of the road in the US? Or... You no, know, it isn't. And if there is no line that defines the traffic lane, the car drives in the middle of the road. Uh, uh, and it, uh, it, it, it tends to drive a little bit right, but it drives more in the middle on the road. But when there comes a car in opposite direction, then it drives r right. Yeah. So yeah, th th this is identical, but it drives more in the middle on the road if there is no marking on, on the road. Yeah, yeah. Is there any differences between uh, machines work in America and machines work in the US? Yeah, yeah, it, it is um, in, in United States. It is, it's, it's from the legislative side. In the United States, it's allowed to, to use that. Uh, in Europe, not. Uh, it's just a different legislation. In the United States, if there happens an accident, then uh, this situation will be analyzed. And if it is in the fault of the car manufacturer, the car manufacturer will be punished. In Europe, uh, the car manufacturer have to homologate the system before they go on road. That means they have to do all this effort in advance. And Tesla is a company that goes very fast into new technologies, and they do it on the road. Uh, uh, but uh, this is not allowed in Europe, so therefore we have restricted uh, um, functionality here in Europe. Uh, my question was focused on different view. Uh, they base these things on the testing data. They do have more data from US compared to Europe, where is the different signs and so on. Yeah. So there, my question was focused on if uh, there is a differences yeah. from US. Yeah. And Traffic situation yeah. and so on. Yeah, that's a very good question. 
Tesla has a big advantage, a advance in comparison to other companies. They have more than one million cars on the road and the cars communicate with Tesla. And they can use the data. Even if you have not activated the autopilot or driving assistance function, uh, traffic situations are captured and if they are extraordinary, if they are different than standard, the data might be sent to Tesla to be evaluated there and processed. And this is done around the world. Uh, so they have really, perhaps, they have the largest amount of data available today in terms of real traffic scenarios. Yeah. So to your question, uh, they, they have sufficient Teslas in Europe for getting this data. I, I was in Australia in, in September this year, and in Australia there are 274 Teslas. Uh, and even in Alice Springs, which is in the middle of Australia, near the Uluru, near this mountain, this famous mountain, are two Teslas. And all the data is available for the company, for Tesla. And all, I know it so well because we have a cooperation with the university and they did a research project together with Tesla uh, to process this data. And therefore, I know it's 274 Teslas in Australia <laughs> this time. Uh, the, the car manufacturer has access to that data, yeah, and they use that. Okay, yeah, thank you for your question and the remark. The final video, do you have some more minutes? I have another video of a laser sensor. Okay, then I will show you very quickly. The laser sensor um, produces a three-dimensional picture of the environment. It's a much more complex functionality because they use the, the laser beam and the reflection. Uh, and this is a video that was made by Velodane. So it, it, it's some kind of advertising video. It, it's not really scientific, but it shows very nice the, the picture that is created by the laser sensor. Uh, in that case, the, it's, it was a roof top laser sensor, so on the roof of the car rotating 360 degrees. And I just want to show you that to, to give an impression of the quality uh, of a laser sensor-based environment. And you see it's three-dimensional. That means the distance measuring is very accurate. And also the contours of the objects, of the cars, of the people, uh, dogs, whatever are around here can be uh, identified very much. The video is not brand new, I think it's about five years old, and in the meantime, there are more accurate laser sensors uh, uh, available. Uh, what you see here, it, it makes shadows. So it's a light-based system, and of course we have shadow effects, so it cannot look behind uh, objects. Um, and here today, as, as the Waymo car shows, there's a number of laser sensors, and the representation of the environment is Fusion, so it's based on, on, on the fusion of, of the combined data uh, of the laser sensor. This distance measurement to objects we can also do with camera systems, but not with this high accuracy as we have with the laser, with the LiDAR-based systems. In the script you will find a short description of the strengths and weaknesses of radar sensor, cameras and laser sensors. Uh, for explanation, I also have added the ultrasonic parking sensor, ju just some explanations, but due to time reasons, I will not jump into detail here. Yeah. Okay, with this, questions? No. With this, I will close my presentation. I just have one or two slides regarding the challenges that we have when we talk about or when we develop. So here is the description. What are the challenges that we have with automated driving functions? Um, it's mainly the role of the driver. So the driver is out of the loop. I explained that before. That means that the system must work very reliable and very safe in all conditions. And uh, this is done by extensive testing uh, and uh, a huge amount of data. 
as a different to um, standard system in cars where we just can switch off if there occurs an error or a failure. So many systems in cars, we, not all, but many, we, we can switch off and warn the driver. So to drive more careful or to stop the car. With uh, self-driving cars or automated driving, we cannot switch off. So the system, even in case of an error, has to be functionally, has to be reliable because otherwise it would be too dangerous. Or at least it has to be reliable for some seconds until the driver takes over in level three. And how is it done? Uh, it is done by using a huge amount of data with the combination of sophisticated sensor systems. And here I have an example of the vision-based challenges that we have. So here we see a traffic situation Perhaps it was after the rain because we have reflections here uh, and the sensors do not identify the objects correctly. So we need better hardware, we need better vision-based system or perhaps a laser sen LiDAR sensor. In that case, we, we have implemented here a night view uh, camera that is able to identify uh, the object accurately and classify it's a bicycle, it's a car, and so on. So it's uh, the requirements on the hardware, on the sensor system, and on the other side, it's the requirements on the software. Uh, this is just a funny picture from, from China, but it, it might be the case that you have animals on the road or you have situations on the road that never have been before, and even in that case, the system has to react correctly. And here your question goes in line. It's a huge amount of data to be processed, to be gathered and to be processed for the training of the, of the software. Yeah, so with this, I would like to close my class, my lecture today. It was a pleasure for me to be here. I hope I could give you some insights into automotive electronics and the, the, the challenges that we have in, in the development of electronic systems with a focus on uh, sensor systems for automated driving. Some questions or remarks? Yeah, please. Yeah, I have just one question. Uh, in close future, there will be no 100% uh, reliable machine. So, question is. Uh, It's already some contour where we be the required level of the legislative. Yeah, th that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, the big challenge that I see is um, that we need to develop testing scenarios and testing procedures to evaluate if a system is mature enough or right to be used in traffic or not. Uh, the so-called so homologation. Uh, procedures. And there are big discussions this time how to define such homologation procedures for automated driving functions. In, in Europe, uh, as, as we discussed before, the legislative situation is that we need homologation procedures and then the cars are allowed to drive in public road. In the United States it's different. Also in China it's different, I have to say. But for Europe we need very um, clear and very accurate testing procedures uh, to be developed to release the car for, for road. Uh, Mercedes has done this uh, over the past two years and is now with this level three functionality homologated in the market, but uh, it's limited complexity. So we will see how this will involve um, uh, in the next years. Uh, we think a lot about how to define these testing procedures and homologation procedures. Yeah. You're welcome. Some other questions? Please. What type of light does the laser system use? It's yeah. Light infrared. It, it's high frequent uh, pulsation. Uh, it's, um, pa, I, I have to think about the wavelength, but it, it is uh, um, not in the visible light range, so uh, um, it, it's infrared, but I, I don't know the. Uh, the accurate frequency, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's uh, 950 nanometers. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, so in this range. Mm -hmm.
can I ask uh, sure. the interference, interference between the sensors from a different car? In the, a lot of cars will use the leaders, for yeah. example. Yeah. How it is solved in reality? It, it's not solved yet. This is a big problem. It, it, it works for a certain small number of cars with laser sensors, with, with modulation processes, and, and, and as, as we know. But it, it's not proven how this will work if there are thousands of cars. Yeah. Um, this is an open point. Yeah. And it is similar situation in radars and uh, ultrasonic sensors or not? Yeah. Is yeah. there any identification of the signals? Yeah, from... yeah. Uh, with radars it's more simple because the radars are more directed, not 300 degrees, but there are identification uh, um, methods applied for uh, modulation uh, of, of, of the frequency. But for a laser, um, we have a much higher number of beams or much higher intensity, and therefore it, it will be as simple as it is for radar, for example. With the ultrasonics, we have it and they don't care. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's often the case that you stand on, on, on a traffic jam on, or on a, on a crossroad and you hear your parking pilot beep because of nothing. This is mostly because there are some in interferences with other sensors. It's not so critical because it's just for parking pilot. So it's not for driving dynamics. But in case of driving dynamics, this is absolutely a very relevant aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's about infrared cameras? Uh, mm -hmm. Is this uh, some extension for, for the sensors? In the yeah, it, it is. It's even available today. So some car manufacturer uh, offer night view cameras, uh, which are uh, uh, um, for, for night vision uh, improvement. And they are in mass production. I know it from Mercedes, Porsche also has this system. Um, it's, it's a very good approach, um, but in case that we have a laser, a LiDAR sensor, it might be not necessary because the LiDAR sensor uh, uh, yeah, works more accurate and more reliable. But in general, it, it is an option, yeah. Mm -hmm. And can we compare the data from uh, LiDAR and 3D cameras? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so 3D cameras um, deliver uh, dif distances. It's about the distance measurement, but not in the accuracy of, of LiDAR sensors. So in, with the 3D cameras, we, we are in the accuracy range of yeah, some centimeters. Um, perhaps lower, it depends. With the LiDARs, we are in the range of millimeters or fractions of millimeters. So they're much more accurate. Uh, and the 3D cameras have another problem. Um, they are more sensitive to light re, uh, reflections. Um, also, we have it with the laser, but with the laser, we have a so high density of, of beams or of radiation uh, that this can be compensated pretty well, not so with, with the camera systems. But both are used for distance measuring. So for the, for the cameras, we have this time of light uh, uh, um, uh, method or the 3D cameras where we have two cameras that map the, the angle to the direction to a pixel point or a point in the view and so calculate the, the distance. Yeah. Both is applied. What's interesting, um, some companies like Tesla uh, say they don't need something else than cameras. So they really focus on this vision-based identification because they have the opinion the human driver also only has the eyes. Uh, and it works pretty well, I have to say. So it, it's not really solved or, or it's not really clear which is the best solution. But uh, just two weeks ago, a friend of mine who lives in, in California, in San Francisco, did send me photos with Teslas with LiDAR sensors on the roof. So they also test the LiDAR, the laser-based systems, not only the cameras, even if they publish that they uh, yeah, believe on, on the cameras only. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Another question, because the time is closing. I think it, it's uh, lunchtime, right? G give me some very short feedback. How do you like it? W was it interesting for you or th did you does it fit to your uh, uh, um, interests or G give me some feedback? It was it too much, too less? Was it understandable or not? J just a short feedback would be nice. 
because we are in power engineering, uh, it is really, for, for me, it's a very wide uh, range of information. Uh, there is a lot of questions, there is a lot of a way with which we can uh, uh, <coughs> see. Uh, actually, because I, I'm not sure if the students are able to, to understand to all the uh, contraction or how to say. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, as a first information, as a first step, is very very clear, and, and for me it's uh, very important and interesting uh, in this moment uh, for, for overview mm -hmm. how how complex is the technology in the car, mm -hmm. and uh, we can. Uh, Maybe compare in, uh, into the industry here uh, used in uh, power station. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So the power station is also a very complex uh, technology mm -hmm. uh, driven by the human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is also some uh, uh, units, uh, the CPU and uh, SCADA systems mm -hmm. and actuators yeah. and sensors. Yeah, right. and, mm -hmm. and the humans are needed for the emergency situation. But there is a lot of uh, controlling systems which uh, uh, applies to the power plant and mm -hmm. optimize the, the working of the power plants. But the safety systems works au au automatically yeah. without the humans yeah. and uh, increase the reliability and safety of the power station, especially in the nuclear power plants. There are yeah. a lot of uh, safety systems and, yeah. and the redundancy of the systems. And so I think uh, the car system, the car industry, automotive industry is uh, very close to, to the power, power systems uh, industry because the, in the power systems we also need a big reliability and a safety emergency mm -hmm. uh, like in the cars because uh, we put here our lives uh, yeah. when we go uh, with, with the cars. So it's a similar when we operate uh, the big power plants. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, for, for us, uh, it is a big challenge to use uh, this uh, thinking and design also in uh, other, other in kind other of technology. Yeah. Yeah, because if we see on, for example, a cogeneration unit, it's like a car. There is mm -hmm. a motor, generator, some, some uh, protections, some, yeah. some switch gear and, and, and something, and some control unit and, and plan for, for, the, for the operates. Yeah. So it is very similar, but uh, just only stay in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a garage or yeah. in, in a, some, yeah. some building. Yeah. But uh, here it's more complex, more, more complicated, because you move in a, in a real public uh, environment. Op, uh, areas. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you affect more, more other, other people, other, other subjects in, in the reality. So I think it is uh, quite a big uh, dimension for, and we can s use part of this uh, technology, part of this design and thinking to, to the, for example, our engineering, our engineering. Uh, units. Mm -hmm. Especially if, if we will uh, think about the uh, standards like vehicle to grid or vehicle to yeah. to load and cooperation of uh, the vehicle with the with the power systems, yeah. Yeah. Uh, distribution of energy, uh, stability of the, yeah. of the systems network, and so on. So I think there is a very close uh, join with automotive and and power power mm. engineering, as as I feel. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, some additional remarks. No, I think you are hung hungry, right? I'm too. So thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a good lunch. Thank you. Thank you.